So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I think it's time to start. I'm delighted that you all joined me here. Thank you for that. And let's get started. What I'm going to talk today uh, with you, obviously, I will talk about me and myself. That's about half an hour. And then for the next 10 minutes, I will cover the rest of it. OK? Ah, just kidding. Uh, so I will we'll go further with a few security facts, which I, I focus today, because the landscape is, is enormously big, so I, I can't talk about everything in, in uh, 45 minutes. Um, and this something is, is related to software-defined uh, networking and security. And uh, the term I, I use here is as the X, because uh, that's kind of variable. Uh, I will either focus for more for security side or networking side. And I will talk about concepts and also about implementation and then specific applications. And at the end, uh, I will have a few more ideas uh, to share with you. And in the middle, middle of that, uh, we have a short demonstration how it, uh, how it really works. <coughs> so that topic for today is, is, is challenging by itself uh, because it's, it's kind of bleeding edge. That's why there is a question mark in, at the end of my question. Is it really possible? And I hope you get some idea what's possible today after my presentation. Right. I always see some few, few faces here. So for those uh, who don't know me, my name is Kolev. And I have about 15 years of, of uh, field experience on, on different areas. I started a uh, software development world. Uh, this is uh, the lower part, uh, low level programming and, uh, and, uh, and C stuff. Uh, later on, I escalated to network and, and security areas. So this is what I have done last uh, 14, 13 years. Uh, with, with different vendor technologies, with uh, open source technologies, etc. And, and last uh, six to seven years, uh, I, I mostly put my focus uh, on, on security aspects uh, around data center and data center architecture. So how, how to pull all the stuff together, not just uh, one piece, piece of it. And uh, to put things in, in perspective, uh, I picked uh, different uh, slide from the Horizon uh, Security Airport. And I, I picked this one to illustrate speed of different teams. So the, the black hats, they usually need a few minutes till a few hours to get the compromise done. But uh, uh, as, as unfortunate it is, for the white hats, it takes uh, weeks or months to get this discovered. So as I see, the, the biggest uh, challenge in the, the whole security landscape, which is really badly covered, is uh, this detection piece. Uh, as we saw in the morning, uh, what colleagues of mine were sharing, that, that we have to design the systems with a mentality that it will be broken sooner or later. So we have to really focus on how do we discover that. And obviously, later, we, we would like to mitigate it also, right? So just discover is, is not, not alone important. So we need to get one step further from there. And, uh, and another graph I would like to share with you was uh, some significant uh, exposure uh, with a, which I picked from, from Cisco Annual Security Report. And uh, this is uh, regarding web threats. So, uh, so it's, it's a bit different perspective uh, than previous talkers. Previous talkers uh, were mostly focusing on, on software we develop. I will talk uh, about another side of coin. So this is related to software we use. Uh, and from this graph, basically what you see is that during the last year, all the web web malware, which were delivered, executed, get into the system, was Java-based. 
We don't develop Java. It's done by somebody else. We have very little or, or no control of whatsoever what the vendor is, is uh, doing or not doing. So we have to live with that. And, and that, again, brings back to our, to our uh, workstation side of story where we don't really that much develop of the software, but we're using it. So if this breaks in, in uh, into the systems, there is a pretty good chance that it tries to spread. And, uh, and to my knowledge, there is no uh, spreading technology which is invisible. So it's either wired or, or wireless, but teleportation is, is not known to me, at least. So there is a science if the malware is spreading inside your organization. So if, if it has signs, it's, it's our job to discover those and uh, get action on those. So let's have a look on, on classical uh, organization we have today. And, uh, and despite uh, Jan saying that uh, security part of organization can't live its own, it, today it is, right? So that's a sad truth. And uh, what are the typical keywords which are, are tied to that uh, kind of tribe, if you like, is, is really the task is complex, right? There are too many variables. You have to analyze them through, uh, and it takes time. So that brings us, us really keyword slow as, as mentally, and it's repeatedly slow all the time. Another aspect of that is, is it usually has a limited reach. There are a few sensors over there and there. Maybe it's network sensor, maybe it's workstation sensors, but they are really kind of occasional. So the, the whole coverage of the whole infrastructure is, uh, is far from perfect, right? So it's not extensively deployed. And that also brings us to secondary impact of, of uh, kind of small bots in infrastructure, and that's performance. So you can't really scale if it's just in one or two pieces. And also, which slept through uh, Tavi's face was a really slow of change. So if you need to get some things to be done in, in firewall rules or, or application rules or patching or, or anything what it is, it's, it's really, really slow. Uh, and obviously, we, we don't talk about the perimeter uh, for, a, for a quite some time, so it's all kind of fuzzy, cloudy, right? <coughs> and uh, from the other side, there is a kind of networking team which kind of have evolved already a few steps in, in, uh, in agile direction. And uh, that's behind the buzzword SDN, Software Defined Networking, right? Essentially, what it is, is uh, the coupling uh, control plane, uh, a management plane, and data plane. So down below, you have a bunch of, of really different kind of, of devices, all what they're good to be. And then uh, they, they just do what they are told to do. And this comes from the next layer, which is a controller layer. And the controller layer is also kind of infrastructure side. So the real intelligence is in applications. So what the network should do. This is all what about uh, SDN is, right? And what this kind of uh, model gives us is really fast deployment. So we can spin up the virtual firewalls or load balancers or, or anything uh, really on spot. Uh, so that gives us dynamic. This also gives us scale. So we can put them in, a, in a place as we need, as quickly as we need. And it also, by definition, should give us flexibility because it's, it's all software defined. So we can say you should do that or that. So uh, from the other side, because the network is, is really everywhere, so we can say that it's pervasive. It touches each and every host we have in our infrastructure. It's either wired or wireless, I really don't care but it's, it's the first touch point, right? So what is the most obvious thing you can do this kind of uh, 
challenges and, and opportunities. You want to put them together, right? So I added the third component, uh, which is uh, application, this is Mixa. Uh, and this is because most of all, we care about application security, right? So the network by itself, obviously it should be secure, but, uh, but applications are the one which give us access to data, right? The data by itself, it's, it's kind of hard to read. It might be encrypted or whatever. But the application is the interface we need to get access to data. So all those three components put together in some sort of smart way gives us software-defined security. So the N there in between is in, uh, in kind of maybe there or maybe not. So uh, I use it consistently throughout the presentation. So uh, don't worry about that. So it gives you kind of just a touch point that it, it might be related to networking, not necessarily always, but, but it, quite often it is. So this new model is, is kind of very simple in, uh, in, uh, in one slide, right, isn't it? <laughs> Why shouldn't you do it, <laughs> right? Because uh, there is also other things which have to change. So today's model, security-wise, is really reactive. You act on something, uh, you absorb something, you do something, uh, and there is a huge workflow to do change management, uh, fixing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I think uh, we should be more forward-looking. That means uh, we are more based on policies. So we, we define something, uh, and this is repeatedly used and used and used in a way which is convenient for us. And for us, is abstract mean. It could be developer, it could be operational team. It really doesn't matter. But the idea is to get rid of those uh, workflow management concepts which you do, or cabs, or, or change management, or, or whatever it is. But you're, you're trying to define the policies, and they are really automatically deployed or attached to the infrastructure. So this is, this is a major change. So you don't do hunting for 90% time and 10% uh, for development, but the idea is to work it around. So you, you do mostly development one time and then use it 10 times, or actually machines will use it 10 times. <laughs> this is, I, I know it, it sounds a little bit crazy, uh, but, but we've seen that uh, working in, in uh, other areas I was covering. For example, the, the unified computing platform is exactly about the same thing. You don't do daily changes or, or small changes all the time or, or deployment all the time, but you, you do the one time, you do pro policy, and then you just use that policy or template or whatever it is. And it really gives you kind of boost on repetitive task or similar task. So what this should give us is, is actually all those things we lack in, in, in security perspective. So if we can, can deploy this model widespread, it gives us visibility, really. We have visibility into all, all parts of our infrastructure because everything is connected to network, right? It also should give us abstraction, abstraction layer. So we don't talk necessarily in terms of IP or port addresses or, or, or URLs, but we talk about something more general, like application or some part of application function, like a application uh, web part of application functions. So inherently with that function we know we should apply different kind of security policies over there. A uh, third, third component which is, is related to that is, is automation. And the automation actually has two sides. It could be automation in terms of, of deployment, or it could be automation in terms of reaction. So I will give you a couple of layers, examples later on when I, I, I illustrate what I mean by actions and automatic actions, because there are quite some actions which haven't been available before. And this also gives us scalability, inherently, because it's all is distributed uh, and flexibility and orchestration. So what are those uh, kind of functions uh, or, or, or components 
if we talk about uh, SDN as a, as a kind of reference base from where we could go further. And, uh, and this is pretty tricky. So uh, most of you, I guess, have heard about OpenFlow, right? This is SDN. So who knows OpenFlow? Hands up. One, two, three, four. OK, almost 10. <laughs> Wonderful. But, but that's actually only a small part which has to do with forwarding. There are, there are many, many more aspects in, in software-defined security or networking than just packet forwarding. So it could be about the policy controls, which, will be, which traffic will be sent where and, uh, and on which conditions. Uh, it could be about uh, different uh, deployment models, uh, which can be reused or as a reference models or building blocks in, in a bigger automation scheme. Uh, it has some rudimentary but, but, but general uh, management and monitoring tools which also should be kind of unified. Uh, so there are basically for each of those aspects there is a, some either standard from ITF proposal or, or RFC or, or etc. So the SDN is not just one protocol, it's, it's really framework where all those different pieces go together. And, and if there is a framework, there could be a few ways to implement it, right? So basically, I, I put there two ways how it could be implemented. Probably you can think of, of third way. So the right-hand side, the classical model, which you've seen already today before. So there is a bunch of um, networking devices, or any devices, but generally networking devices. And there is a controller layer which controls each and every device, has a knowledge of topology, the statistics, uh, the flows, uh, the <coughs> performance characteristics, etc. And there is an application. This is a brain, which, which controls all those uh, things below it. And there could be actually a variety of applications. It doesn't mean that there is one. But there is a many applications who talk to unified controller layer over the standard APIs. And, and, and the key here actually is that everywhere there are public APIs to, to which next layer can talk, right? Another model how this can be built uh, is that there is an application and there is a variety of application clients, so to say. So those could be physical or virtual. Uh, those could be controllers as well. So uh, it's, we call it kind of peer-to-peer -peer model because it's not necessarily hierarchical. So the flows or control messages could, could go from between the different sites to have interaction or request some services from other, other components. So, so let's have a look uh, first on, on one of the examples of peer-to-peer uh, -peer model. So this is rather simplistic. Uh, and this is from, from Cisco currently. Cisco model uh, is pretty simple. You've got the application, and you've got the device, which is part of this application stack. So from the device side, there is an open uh, PK API, open uh, northbound. And then you can, uh, can have your, your way of, of programming the application, which directly talks to your devices, one or many. It really doesn't matter. And, and uh, your way, by that I mean it could be C, or it could be Java, or it could be Python, uh, or, and there is also RESTful API. So whatever you choose, uh, that's up to you. And, uh, and there are a variety of kind of service sets which are below from which you can pick your, your kind of service, what you like. Is it data path service, or is it uh, some discovery, or policy, or or topology or, or whatever it is. And uh, support-wise, uh, pretty, pretty much uh, most of operating platforms are supported. Uh, I will go into details in a few slides later. But this is, again, a general concept. Uh, and, and for a programmer, there is a really ready-made API which they, they can use on a language of their choice. So, to give you just a glimpse of what those different service sets uh, contain, so let's pick uh, routing service sets. So mean, it means you can modify routing tables, add routes, remove routes, or you, if you want to visualize something, uh, there is a top discovery, so you can uh, get the discovery how it looks in, in layer three world, for example, or layer two, or, 
or whatever layer of, from OZ stack is, is interest of you. And uh, there are obviously data path services, so packet inception, packet copy, uh, duplication, uh, et cetera. Uh, so from the platform perspective, the data center platforms are supported, the Nexus 3K, 5K, and 6Ks. For the wide area networking, the ISR routers, or, or security perspective, wide area stuff, uh, VPNs, firewalls, um, the ISR G2s uh, for high scale uh, uh, security or, or wide area, the ASRs are also supported and from the service provider, the 9Ks from the ASR platform support this model 1PK. 1PK stands for Open Network Environment. So that means the, the APIs are all public, published uh, for each and every one of you here. Just uh, register and have a look. There is a developer portal in, in, uh, in Cisco domain. And uh, the, the hopefully good news is that uh, the catalyst range for, for access layer will also be supported uh, this year. So that's, that's promising. If you talk about the model, how this is implemented, there could be different applications, right? Because I haven't taught you any, any application yet. So it could be either local to the device model, which is really kind of quick interaction. So if you need some uh, packet uh, analysis to do the locally, you don't necessarily forward it to your application, which is far, far in a cloud, but you do it locally. Or if it's like a more trending or analysis or long-term policy selection or, or modification, then you, you obviously can communicate with your application which is sitting somewhere in your data center. So deals could be all over your, your infrastructure. So all those options are, are actually available. Now, the, another model is more of a classical model, hierarchical, so to say. So here is your, your forwarding plane or forwarding devices or, or security devices or whatever it is. And there is an infrastructure controller layer and there is a control programs or applications who control it. And, and in this domain, I, I would like to show you the Open Daylight project, which is going on for, uh, I don't know, year or two or levy. And this is pretty wide consortium where all the major participants are, are actually already in platinum uh, kind of membership level, but there are also a few others who are gold and whatever the levels are, they are not that important, but what the level is. But the important is that it's really industry-wide consortium. And, and most of these guys have contributed something to this open daylight. Open means it's public domain again, just take and use it. So what is the current state of, of uh, open daylight? So it's controller, as I said. By definition, it started as an as a open flow controller. So the southbound API is open flow 1.1, 1. 1, uh, 1 1.0, sorry. And uh, there is a actually flexible plugin layer for southbound APIs. So you can add your own uh, whatever a plot protocol or communication means it is you want to talk to your device. Then there is a service abstraction layer which kind of hides specific uh, feature or specific visibility of what kind of hardware or software it is. It's kind of general functionality. It's either routing functionality or, or, or uh, I don't know, packet forwarding or uh, packet coloring or, or whatever the functionality is. So it's not vendor independent at that point. So it's general function. And then there is a bunch of kind of uh, processes or, or, or ready-made components which you can use already in your applications. So it's, it's, uh, there are some routing uh, protocol calculation support, some uh, forwarding rules management, but you can forward or, or tag or copy or remove headers or whatever. Uh, there are concepts of interfaces and host already. Uh, there is a ARP handler which can understand what, what thing is ARP. So you don't have to actually implement all your basic functions. They are all part of controller. So you can use them. What you have to do is there is a 
big void over there. This is where you can put your application, right? And, and the good practice is that uh, you have something uh, sort bound, uh, not bound up there, something which can actually control this thing. So this is actually where your real application is, is going. So uh, how you communicate uh, not bound, there are currently at least two interfaces. There is a RESTful interface and uh, OSG for, for Java stuff. Uh, and this is how you can, can put things together. What Cisco has done actually is they took the open daylight and already had it some uh, applications. So uh, I may briefly introduce you your monitoring application and slice management and topology independent forwarding. But they also added uh, some uh, kind of infrastructure management like uh, authentication and AGA properties over there. So it's, it's really should be reliable and, and enterprise uh, deployment uh, ready. And uh, what, what Cisco also added is, is one PK API. So the one PK, uh, which I was just discussing a few slides ago. So it's also supported as a southbound interface over there. So for example, the Nexus 3000s, which uh, are, uh, are supported over there. So they can be talked over there. Uh, one PK or actually any, any product uh, which you saw in previous slide can, can be controlled over there, one PK using the means and, and all the ready-made components in the, in the controller. <coughs> so what is that you can do with a open uh, daylight controller or, or XNC for, for uh, if you favor on, on on vendor, other vendors. So you can do basic things like uh, drop or forward packet, right? It's, it's not rocket science. Uh, you could do that with basically everything, right? But you, more tricky it comes can, is that you can, can modify packets. So you can change VLANs. You can do uh, removal of headers for, for your processing, uh, add them back. You can modify the MAC addresses. You can modify the IP addresses. Uh, you can modify the type of service. Um, you can modify uh, higher levels in, in the packet. Uh, you can alternate the routing decisions to send it to a different next hop or, or a different uh, exit port from, from standard uh, forwarding table. And, uh, and you obviously can send the packets to controller as well for further processing. So this actually gives a uh, Quite, quite nice flexibility. You can do almost everything you, you can imagine with uh, anything which touches the network. So let's give, give a small example over here. I've prepared a small demo. Uh, and uh, the content of demo is basically dynamic port mirroring. Actually, it's not dynamic port mirroring, but it's dynamic uh, session mirroring. So this is something uh, uh, wasn't possible till uh, software-defined networking, right? So how it's built up? There is uh, some infrastructure which is capable of doing that, obviously. There are some clients and there are some servers which communicate, right? And, uh, and there is a, let's presume there is a, some uh, security analytics device. In, in my example, there is a drone source file, which is IDS, IPS, next gen. And and if this guy gives alert to the controller, open daylight controller or XNC, then uh, this specific flow, uh, which was kind of triggering that alert, will be put on, on extended mo monitoring mode. So that specific mode gives a switches command to have a replica of that specific flow or, or uh, maybe all traffic from that host or all traffic between uh, source and destination or, or whatever I give into the command, which is going out from there, or in my application, I, which is sitting on top here, I can make modification, obviously, to the command. So if this guy says that there is a, a bad flow going on between that workstation and that server, uh, I can extend that. I want to, to monitor all the flows which come from, from that, uh, that host. That's up to me as, a, as application developer. So I can put in my application whatever rules I want. 
So, uh, and the result is that there is a specific flow entry created in, in uh, infrastructure somewhere, and this specific uh, flow, or, or actually what I, what I wanted, the session or, or destination source pair or just source, will have, uh, have been sent for extended monitoring. So, um, obviously, I can filter it in place, right? Send everything over there, but, but I really don't want to handle the load which is going through the backbones of, of the major enterprises. It's, it's hundreds of megs or, or gigs, uh, so uh, if I push that to my uh, Wireshark or any, any other smart analysis uh, appliance, uh, I really can't cope with that. So I, I use a scalpel, not the bulldozer. So let's, let's have, a, have a look how it's built up. So in my demo, I have one workstation uh, where I'm sitting with keyboard. You see it in, in a moment. Uh, when I send uh, interesting traffic, you will see it's really interesting. And there is a destination which receives the traffic. Uh, and there is a my monitoring station which initially is pretty empty, doesn't get anything, uh, until there is a specific call coming in from my IPS or whatever triggering system which instructs to have this, this traffic between flows, uh, those hosts, to be mirrored to my analysis workstation. Right? Simple. So let's, let's pray for, for demo gods. break to, to get the connection up. So we just connect my demo environment. And you should see it over there, right. So <clears throat> this is my first uh, workstation from where I'm sitting, and I'm going to send interesting traffic from there in a moment. And then I will just uh, start a few, few TCP dump sessions. Oops. So 2.1 is uh, my artificial target, and uh, 3.1 is my monitoring station or analysis station, right? <coughs> so if I send some traffic from there, you see it's reaching my uh, expected destination, but the monitoring station doesn't get anything, right? Now I artificially fake uh, some message which will be sent uh, to my controller as a syslog message from uh, my my IPS system that, uh, that there is an issue with those hosts, uh, right? And uh, if I, okay, I haven't shown you the flow table, sorry. But it's basically here, and you see it's currently empty. Now if I come back to my environment <coughs> and launch the ping again. That's how you have the both consoles. Now you see my monitoring station is getting the traffic because I instructed my infrastructure to make this specific uh, flow entry which mirrors the traffic. So let's have a look. Do we have, yes, we have new no flow entry which it says from one to two. Uh, one is a uh, first and second is the destination, right? And there is a new flow target which uh, says that uh, this third machine over there should get also the copy. So, how it's done? Uh, let's see. Can we can we get a glimpse? So it's a small piece of Java code, actually, and uh, it's pretty pretty straightforward. So this is the main entry point. Uh, in, in receiving packet, okay, probably you don't see anything, right? 
So let's make it a little bit bigger. Is there any chance you see something? Eh? Or should I make it even bigger? And otherwise, it doesn't fit anything to screen, right? So, so there is a packet handler. And this is a packet handler if I send the packet to my controller. So what it does, it checks, is it Ethernet? Is it uh, V4? Is it, is it UDP? And if it's UDP, fine. That might be my, my, uh, my um, trigger packet from uh, syslog. And if I go back to the, the handle UDP packet, then I do a check. If it's really syslog, then I go further and process that syslog packet. I get out of that the source uh, and destination host IPs. Then I uh, create uh, the match statement. This is a flow I'm interested. And uh, in this specific case, I say all traffic between source and destination. This is over here, right? And uh, then I create the special action. Uh, and action is uh, kind of have a different uh, MAC address on, on copy packet. And that's, that's pretty much it. I can go one, one step down and show you also the create action. But it's, it's really you do a set new destination and you, you find actually where this another destination is uh, to get the right place to, to add this kind of uh, flow mirroring in which node in infrastructure because uh, Everything is known to the controller, so you can say, please send to this guy, and uh, they will figure out, okay, this is a point uh, I will get the flow, and this is the destination, and uh, this is how it should be sent. That's pretty much, pretty much it. For example. Cool. Simple. So let's go further. This is not the end of the world, right? <coughs> and we go further from there, right? Uh, there is a next step actually coming up, and uh, this is coming up uh, again from from the Cisco. And what they put together is the the kind of dream, uh, or they call it vision, but actually I would say it's really dreamland. Uh, what you want really. You don't really want to mess with IPs or different attachment points or, or all those gritty nitty stuff. So what you really want is you want policy. So this is your wonderful application specific policy. So my application, very smart application, has a bunch of front end web servers, which should be obviously nicely firewalled. And then there is a small application layer with 25 servers, for example. And they need, ni need nicely balanced and, and proper security applied. And at the end, there is a maybe small database, and there is a other task which network has to do for it. So you, what you do in your kind of uh, user interface, you describe only this piece, how your application policy looks like. So it's, it's not your firewall policy or load balancer policy or, or, or anything you, you've seen today but it actually composes of all the, all the components. It could have different routing decisions. It could have different uh, geolocation policies or whatever it is. The, the point is that you define really high level policy and that gets translated to some lower level uh, hardware to handle that. And that low, uh, lower level hardware could be almost, as I say, almost anything today. When the Cisco launched the, the ACI vision a year ago, it was only in the Nexus 9K, so the really big, fat uh, data center or platform switches, which are really capable and really nice, and, and, but in Estonian, really, uh, nobody has them, right? Bad luck. But uh, fortunately, they've got some, some smart guys over there, so they actually are, are working on, on scaling it down. Uh, and. Uh, and it's reaching a point where the, the platform compatibility will be similar to one PK. So it actually is using the same uh, model inside as, as uh, XNC or Open Daylight. 
So let's, let's see uh, what, what, I, what I mean if I say that the policy can be arbitrary. Uh, uh, how it's built up, it's, it's, th there is your intelligent fabric, right? Intelligent, uh, by, not by itself, but by the policy which is given from the policy engine. And this policy engine actually can give you, can give you different policies. And, uh, and what it can say, for example, for your flow, that, that please send this flow, dear, dear fabric, to this firewall for inspection. Or if I don't want firewall inspected, fine, I just remove it from the policy and it will go to somewhere else, maybe some smart routing uh, decision or, or load balancing or quality of service setting or whatever it is. The point is, is that this whole policy is independent of physical hardware or uh, connection points. So the, the fabric, or actually fabric plus controller, are smart enough to direct the, the flows where they can be handled, right? So in this kind of infrastructure, you basically only say what kind of functionality this piece can provide. Uh, and because it's all open, so it's not necessarily Cisco piece. So it could be your checkpoint or F5 or, or anything. And in terms of application, you basically talk about groups, host groups or service groups, and then you simply define your, your policy. Uh, and in terms of, of policy, there are a few more actions, like um, uh, additional to making copy, you can say, do not make a copy. That means if somebody wants really to copy your flow, in security wise, it could be a bad thing, right? But you may have your policy which says, no, this flow copy is not, not allowed at all. So from the architecture side, it's pretty much uh, the, the controller platform, which just have two different modules. So for data center, is a data center module, and for the routing switching, uh, there is an enterprise module. But that's just minor difference. So, <clears throat> uh, what are the capabilities you can, uh, can do in, in security contexts? Um, you can do a few different scenarios. Uh, you can do targeted blocking. So, if you discover something, you can block that traffic. You can, it's all dynamic uh, sense, I mean. Obviously, you can do it by your hand always in your current infrastructure, but in an automated way. You can do targeted inspection. So if you have a kind of dumb ideas and, uh, and fancy ideas, uh, you may want to send some traffic for, for extended inspection if that sounds suspicious. Uh, um, you may do kind of targeted packet capture, which I showed you just a moment ago. You can also do uh, targeted kind of uh, rerouting. Uh, so for some traffic which is suspicious, you may slow it down. For example, uh, if there is a risk of, of exfiltration, you see that uh, somebody is stealing something, uh, you can send it through the extended uh, uh, cool down device which really drags the speed down. Because you, you may not want to uh, spook off the, the intruder, so you want to get taps of him, do more further investigation, maybe go back to, to him through other channels, which maybe his attack channel is, is uh, usable for you, some purposes. So uh, those things all can be, can be easily done. So basically, if you look on, on, uh, on life cycle, this infrastructure, which is dynamic, software defined, can really fit into different places. So first, all the stuff is feeded anyway to some analytics. That's it by its nature. All the statistics is gathered together from the whole infrastructure. You don't have to struggle with uh, different methods of, of different devices to, to collect the stuff. Uh, you can mark the traffic. Uh, for example, if you find it suspicious, you can uh, not necessarily drop it because that might be bad experience for user, but you might do some, something which is called tagging in Cisco terms. Uh, so you add special tag to your packets. It's not VLAN tag, but it's some proprietary tag. And later step, you can drop 
specific traffic to specific destinations based on that tag. So you can do really granular uh, blocking, uh, not influencing the, the business critical flows, but only for those which are bad. Um, there are a few more ideas uh, which flow through my, my head. Uh, so the first one, uh, dynamic spanning. This is the one you saw in, in the demo. Uh, data exfiltration, uh, prolonging or slowdown. This is uh, what I mentioned previously. So there is a capability to shape the traffic to, I don't know, 64K, for example. So it's, it's really slow as, as modem for the bad guy. So it doesn't really get any data, but it sees everything is fine and the data is flowing. So it's not spooked off. There could be uh, different uh, redirection. One of those could be redirect to honeypots. So you've got some sp suspicious traffic and you really want to see what the guys are up to, what they want to do. So you redirect them to, to honeypot and uh, take your investigation from there. And, and also, it can be used uh, to kind of control the wider infrastructure. For example, if you have to handle some DDoS on your premises or, or, or your infrastructure, you can do dynamic load balancing and dynamic resource allocation. So you span new, new virtual machines and scale up your load balancing or, or web hosting or whatever that application performance which is under attack. And this can all be controlled from this uh, software defined uh, the cloud. So to sum it up, uh, to today's state, uh, what I observed, uh, the Cisco actually had uh, the, the best current uh, implementation of different tools. It could be uh, either, either a small task I want to do, then I may go just with device APIs. If I have few devices, if I have more, I can go with controller based approach and there is also overlay-based approach, which is uh, the Nexus 9Ks and application-centric infrastructure. So, what you have to do? So, first thing, find the weakest link. So, so the most pressing problem which you see in your environment, right? Then, you have to dream a little bit how you want it to be. It's just dream, right? Because after your dream, then uh, you have to look what you've got. Is there anything you can use to make it happen? And that's not the only choice. Uh, you have to choose also the platform uh, where you can implement, or actually, which satisfies your, your dream and your maybe your current environment. And the partner who can handle the environment and uh, the platform, because it's, it's pretty bleeding edge, I would say. <laughs> In this uh, small demo preparation, take, uh, take a lot of effort from uh, our team. So thank you all who are participating. Liz, Kadrilis, uh, Heiki, Erki. Thank you. So, and then at last, plan a lot of time for it. It's not fast. Questions? <laughs> All right, right. That, that's that's a very good question. Uh, uh, Java itself, it's not the evil. Evil is the people who are using them wrongly. Java is wonderful. <laughs> but the developers who, who can't use it, they are the evil. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I know there are a few developers over there as well, but <laughs> Java by itself, it's, it's just a tool. How you use a tool, you can use knife for cutting your beef, or you can use it for kill a, kill a person. The, the knife is not bad, right? Any other questions? Right. That's far, far too complex question. <laughs> uh, 
I, I think the, the, the first goal uh, for me would really shorten that time span to catch the, the first indication. I think that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the most kind of tangible or, or giving me the best, best benefit, I think. Oh, that, that, that's, more, that's, that's more difficult. <laughs> I would like to be from the months to hours. That, that would definitely help. Uh, we can dream bold in, in 10 minutes, but uh, we know that's not going to happen, probably. Yeah, in theory we could, but there is always the bad thing which called practice or, or real world or whatever you call it. <laughs> That's ugly piece where you see some side effects. So you may want to kind of consider the different side effects and, and use some hysteresis not to kind of give too many false alarms. So there are definitely trade-offs. For, uh, for hours. Should be. Any others? So I still stick around, so if you have uh, some more private questions you want to write here, please just jump by and thank you all. <laughs>